I work in this world. Like I work in the hunting and outdoor industry. And if I don't know these things, there's gotta be a whole lot more people all over the country that are in the same boat and probably know a lot less. And that all led me to believe I had to do something. There had to be something I could do to try to make a positive difference to help this thing I loved so much. And I saw this big knowledge gap and I thought, well, hey, if I need to learn about this stuff. Maybe I can bring everybody along for that learning process. Kind of just like I do with podcasts, right? I want to learn these things. I want to share what I learned with everybody in the podcast. All right. What is up, everybody? I have Jimmy to my right and across from us virtually from the uh, safe space of his pickup, uh, apparently the only kid-free zone in the wilderness right now, we have Mr. Mark Kenyon from Wired to Hunt, also a big, big part of the Meat Eater team uh, as of fairly late. And I actually, Mark, I, so I was on my way in to work this morning, and I was listening to the Wired to Hunt podcast. And I'd like I'd like to say that I was trying to do some sort of like good reporter research, but it was really all just personal research. I was, I was selfishly trying to become a better whitetail hunter listening to the Wired to Hunt podcast, which uh, has a wealth of wealth, a wealth of information, as I like to say, practice my words. But welcome, Mark, to the Vortex Nation podcast. For those who may not be familiar, maybe uh, if you can take a minute, introduce yourself, and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. Yeah, well, thank you guys for having me. It is fun always to be on the flip side instead of being the host of a podcast. It's fun to get to be in the lazy seat, I like to call it, and be the guest <laughs> of the podcast. <laughs> Just go along for the ride. And uh, it's funny. I think about doing my podcast is pretty selfish for me too, because everyone I'm interviewing on that, I'm constantly selfishly just trying to become a better deer hunter myself. So I'm lucky that somehow I'm able to spin it. So it helps other people and people want to listen. But, uh, but yeah, so who I am, I'm uh, an outdoorsman, deer hunter, love everything outside as far as hunting, fishing, camping, backpacking, whatever. Um, my kind of stick within this world though is, as you mentioned, Wired to Hunt is a, a website that I started a long time ago now, and then eventually a series of videos, and then the podcast, which is a very serious Whitetail Hunters podcast. And then a couple of years ago, we merged what I was doing with Wired to Hunt uh, with Meat Eater. And so now I'm part of the Meat Eater team as well. I still host the Wired to Hunt podcast. I also host a new show that we launched last year called The Back 40, right. which is a video series. Um, so I do that. And I'm also a writer. I wrote a book that got published uh, last winter called That Wild Country, which is about the history and future of our public lands and a bunch of my adventures out there exploring these places. So at a high level, that's that's kind of what I do. Awesome. At a high level, you stay busy. Yes. That's, that's yeah. what that sounded like. Pl- plenty Definitely. of things. Plus two, two kids under or two under, and under? Yeah, a two and a half year old and a five month old. Yeah. Yeah. You're busy. Well, I mean, that's, that's all awesome stuff, Mark. And I really, it's really the subject matter that I think we were hoping to dive into today was a lot of um, the Wired to Hunt story, you know, kind of, kind of that origin story. It's super interesting. I mean, I find it fascinating. Um, you know, I feel like you were, uh, or I know you were on the front edge uh, or at the front end of, a, of a, a lot of, I guess, you know, trends in the media world. And uh, yeah, just, just super cool stuff. So what Maybe let's start here, though. Let's go way back in time. And I'd be curious to know how you got your start in hunting or, or maybe even maybe even whitetail hunting. Like, where did, where did that start for you? Yeah, so it started one of the same. I think the very first hunting experience I had was whitetail hunting. And I was three or four years old when my dad started bringing me up to our family deer camp up in northern Michigan. So I was just a little toddler, just kind of bopping along, not knowing what I was doing, of course, but I was there with, with the crew, with the family. And that set it off for me. Now, I don't remember those days, but I do remember when I was probably about six or seven, that's when my memory starts kicking in. And I remember just being in awe of everything, being in awe of like stepping into the, the cabin and the cabins is just like uh, propane lanterns. There's no power. There's no running water. Just a big wood burning stove. 
So you step back in time every time you you head up there. And so I just remember you open the door in the cabin and there's this flickering yellow light kind of bouncing off the walls and the lanterns. And you can hear the wood stove popping and crisping. And you look on the wall behind the wood stove and there's all the antlers with initials of whoever killed that deer in the year. And as a seven or eight year old, I just remember going up to that wall and staring up at it and wondering about the story for every one of those deer. I wanted to know it all. So I bugged the heck out of my grandpa and my uncles and the other guys. Tell me what happened. Tell me about this deer. Tell me about your first deer. Tell me about this. Tell me about that. Is there a story about this? Um, I was just fascinated with it all. And my dad started taking me out there to sit with him. And we didn't see a lot of deer. There weren't a whole lot of deer up there. There still aren't a ton of deer up in that area. But it was, it was enough for me to get excited about it. The camaraderie was a huge thing. Whenever somebody did get a deer, it was the highlight of my year. I remember I'd be sitting in the ground blind with my dad and every gunshot that would go off and it could be five miles away, but every single gunshot would be, dad, was that one of ours? Was that one of our guys? (laughs) So he would have to say like 60 times a day. Nope. Mark, that wasn't one of our guys. (laughs) So that was probably why I never saw any deer because I was just asking questions like that the whole time. Um, But yeah, so from an early age, I was out there and just continued to get more and more and more into it. We, we had a very, um, Oh, I don't know how I describe it. Uh, a very traditional Michigan hunting family way of going about things. They weren't real strategic, I guess you could say. It was mm-hmm. kind of you go out there and you sit in the same spot every year and you wait and see what happens and you shoot the first deer you see. Um, so it wasn't until I got into high school that I was able to kind of branch out on my own and try to learn, like learn how to bow hunt, learn how to pay attention to the wind, learn about all those things. Like I self taught all my all that kind of stuff from there on. Um, and my, my kind of personal obsession outside of just deer camp grew from that point. Um, so that's, I guess, at a high level where it started. Nice. Man. Sounds like uh, with all those questions you were asking everybody, they should have stuck a mic on you back then. You would have had your own podcast started <laughs> even <laughs> well. I get that. That's a very good point. It's in your, it's in your genes. I love uh-huh. it. Do you still have that deer camp then? We do, yeah. You know? Nice. That's, I mean, that's, I mean, that, that is really cool. And I mean, we talk about that a little bit around work here, you know, kind of some of those more traditional deer camps, they seem to be, you know, almost somewhat of a dying tradition. And and that's cool that you guys still have that. And man, I mean, a lot of parallels. I, yeah. I grew up um, hunting blacktails in Western Washington, rifle hunting, but man, just like hearing, like describe, like, you know, your youth and being introduced to that at, at, at those young ages and being brought along probably, probably to the, I guess I, I always say the detriment of my dad's deer hunting success, but, um, man, just like, uh, yeah. And just being completely captivated by deer and wild things, man. Like, like Jim, I, maybe it happens, maybe it's easily induced, but Mark, when you're talking, I like, I was getting chills. I was getting chills. I was oh, like, the yes, goosebumps, the goosebumps yes. were out like, in full force. Like you're, you're wearing long sleeves I'm though. So long, you didn't, you didn't do the <laughs> but yeah, that, that, com- that completely resonated with me personally, for yeah. sure. So that's super cool. Well, and then, you know, I guess, you know, we'll kind of jump in. We'll fast forward here. Sure. Into, you know, the, uh, the beginnings of Wired to Hunt or, or what were you doing before you started, you know, the Wired to Hunt platform? Like what was your trajectory always on that course or like, where were you at when kind of Wired to Hunt started? So I was in college and I was going to college to uh, get a marketing degree. I thought I wanted to work in marketing or advertising, something like that in the business world. And uh, to try to, to, to shorten the story as much as possible, I was in New York City on a summer internship working for a big advertising and PR firm out there right in Manhattan. And I, you know, I had these aspirations of being this big time businessman, whatever. And I got there and pretty quickly I realized, oh, wow, this is not where I want to be. This is not what I want to do. I miss the outdoors and the things I love so much. Um, and part of my job at that company was to work with bloggers, helping them to promote our product, our, our, our clients products. And so that introduced me to this whole world of blogs and online media. Um, and, and just the, the, the viability that those kinds of things had, this was way back in like 2003 or 2004. Um, so very early on all that stuff, Twitter was very early. Like we were, our company was one of the earliest adopters of Twitter, trying to get all of our clients on that and stuff like that. Um, so I saw all this in my daily business life and I thought to myself, 
I could do a blog and I want to be talking about deer hunting. I want to be thinking about deer hunting. I want to be learning about deer hunting, but I can't do that here in Manhattan in my cubicle unless I kind of dive into the virtual world and, and create something. So I did. So I started Wired to Hunt that summer during that internship. It was a fun way to scratch the itch. I had no idea what I was doing. I wasn't a great deer hunter, um, but it was just a way for me to share and to learn and to, to try to make the best of the situation I was in. So that's how Wired Hunt started, but it started very much as like a personal passion project. Now, fast forward about a year and coming out of that internship, I said to myself, all right, you have to find a way to make a living in the outdoors doing the stuff you love because you realize that that business thing, what you thought was so appealing, that's, that's not for you anymore. Um, you got to find something. So I started looking, tried to find different opportunities in that space, but I was swayed by the, uh, I again, got my eyes off the prize when a company called Google, which a lot of us know, uh, Google came calling and I was able to get a job offer from Google. And that was, you know, at the time, like the rate the number one place to work seemed like something you couldn't turn down. And so I took that job. And that resulted in me going to California to their headquarters, which is just south of San Francisco. So again, I was in a place where I couldn't do, or at least I didn't know how and where to do the things I love. And again, felt cooped up, stuck in a situation I didn't really want to be in. And I realized. Mark, you screwed up. You fell for the the sex appeal of the big fancy job. And um, I realized that I needed to do something with this passion I had for hunting in the outdoors. And so I thought, well, Wired Hunt's still there. And I happened to be in a Barnes & Noble bookstore at this time, kind of feeling down, feeling claustrophobic. And I picked up a book. And this book was all about, um, you know, I think the subtitle was Cash In on Your Passion. It was like building a business, building a life out of your passion. And I thought I read that book in one night and I said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn Wired Hunt into a way that I can live this lifestyle into a career. And, and I'm going to frame my life around this thing I love. I'm doing it. And from that day forward, I worked towards that goal every single day, uh, building Wired Hunt from the ground up. Uh, for four years, I worked on building Wired Hunt on the side, you know, working full time during the day at Google. And then early in the morning, late at the night, building Wired Hunt. And eventually in the fall of 2013, I was able to quit Google and go full-time with Wired Hunt. And uh, at that time, it was just a website and YouTube videos and social media. And I started writing freelance for the hunting magazines at that point too. And the following year, I started the podcast um, and then, you know, kind of grew from there. Man, that's amazing, you know, and, and really like, at least in the hunting space for me, like the Wired to Hunt podcast. In fact, that might even be where I first heard the word podcast, you know, or, or, or darn near. I mean, like we mentioned earlier, I mean, you were on the front edge of blogging, podcasting, and, and it sounds like you attribute some of that just, you know, with your involvement in, in being with, uh, you know, like fast moving, uh, you know, marketing agencies. And then I guess what kind of, I mean, like, at least to me, from the outside in, sometimes, you know, people even talk about that with Vortex, right? Like, oh my gosh, you shot to the moon in, in five minutes, right? And uh, it's like, well, no, like, you know, we're pushing that, pushing that rock, you know, for a real long time, which obviously, you know, hearing that entire story, like you were pushing the wire to hunt rock, you know, for a real long time there. But did you, were you able to borrow things um, from from the tech industry that you were kind of immersed in and, and apply that to wire to hunt then to, to help that along its way? Definitely. I mean, I, I was my my job at Google was working with clients to help them develop online marketing communication strategies using our tools. So that just basically meant I had to be immersed in that world. How do you help companies connect with with uh, consumers? How do you build a brand? How do you build a community? So that's what I was doing as a day to day job. And on the backside, that was what I was essentially trying to do with Wired to Hunt. So yeah, it definitely helped me. I just I knew how to speak that language. I knew the resources to go to. Um, and, and then I am just, I think, I think if there's anything that's helped me with just kind of this in my DNA, it's the fact that I am insatiably curious and I just, I need to learn, 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 learn all the time. I'm obsessed with learning. And so I, I dove in head first into that stuff even further than I had to, um, because I, I just, 
I knew it was important and I just wanted to know. I was so curious to see what you could do and, and what the opportunities were. And so I did that both with the technology and communication and marketing side and then with the hunting side too. Was there kind of a pivotal moment with, um, with the Wired to Hunt podcast where you're like, oh man, this thing does have some legs. Like, is there like almost like a day or maybe a benchmark in, in numbers or you saw maybe some growth happen that you're like, oh man, this is, this is good. Or was it just kind of that slow grind uh, uh, the entire way? Well, you know, with, with Wired to Hunt itself, that was like a slow, I guess it was all kind of a slow grind to tell you the truth. There was never like a aha light bulb moment. It was just, you know, years of hard work and slowly building an audience and a community and network and connections and everything like that. Um, but I will say the podcast, right? The podcast launched in year five of Wired to Hunt. Okay. So when I launched the podcast, um, I didn't realize how impactful that would be because because the podcast really was like a, if, if the curve of growth was like this, the podcast launched and then just went up like that. Um, because that, I think that became a, there was a few things going on there. I think number one, we were relatively early in the podcast game. So right away we were, I was able to have one of the best deer hunting podcasts out there in the world, kind of almost by default. There are a few others. Um, but you know, I had a good thing going from an early start. So I got lucky in that regard, you could say. Um, but then also I think we hit on the sweet spot as far as maybe what was wanted out there. Like there was a need for this deep dive, long form, um, opportunity to learn about this kind of stuff that, you know, the typical TV shows and magazine articles just weren't doing. And we we're able to tap into that pretty early on. And you take that and mix it with my curiosity and maybe some of the skill sets I have as far as, you know, communication and whatnot. I think it kind of worked. And so those things together with the timing um, led to it being much, much uh, more of a audience generator, much more of a connector with our audience than I ever thought. I never realized the unique kind of connection you can develop on a podcast because it's a much more personal thing uh, for the listener, right? It's kind of like they've got their earbuds on, they're listening to you and it's just us. And the, right, even though there might be tens of thousands of other people listening in this moment, it's just us. Mm -hmm. And as a listener of other podcasts, I had felt that I'd become like really connected to the hosts of other shows I'd listened to. Um, and I realized after doing my podcast for a while, it's like, wow, that's actually happening now with my audience. And mm -hmm. so I think it helped me develop a really strong connection with the folks that followed along. And, and that all led good things. Probably the, the, the moment when I realized like, Oh, this, this is going to work was when outdoor life decided to feature me and wired hunt as like the cover story package of one of their issues. And that kind of was a, one of those things like that gratifying, like, okay, you're going to, you're going to do okay. It was a scary thing quitting Google, right? It was a very comfortable job. Oh, yeah. It was a, it was a good situation. We'd always joke that you get these golden handcuffs at Google. You can't leave because the stock options are so good. The everything's so good that you can't leave even if you want to. Um, so I busted out the golden handcuffs, but it was scary to do that. And, yeah. um, and when the outdoor life thing happened, that was kind of some kind of validation, like, okay, you know what? You're not crazy. People are taking notice. Um, you're not an idiot. This might work. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember when, I remember when that hit, like I, I got that issue of outdoor life and, and was aware of you and, and, uh, you know, follow, followed you. But I was like, oh man, I think, you know, I guess, you know, if some, for some reason, at least in my head at the time, it like, it really validated like that platform in some ways. And, mm -hmm. and it was just, it was super cool. One, well, How weird are podcasts too, in that, you know, hearing, hearing you talk about your start in the early slash mid two thousands or whatever, and then kind of moving into five years later, you were starting a podcast. Um, the fact that, what am I trying to say? Podcasts are the thing that almost never should have actually worked. There's no visuals. It's long form. It's not short. It's it, it, it like everything about it is the antithesis of what everybody talks about all the time in marketing. It's like mm -hmm. short, punchy, visual, like in your face. Um, but the the fact of the matter is, people still have 24 hours in a day. 
and they still have interests that they like, and they still have things that they want to spend time learning and talking about or listening about or hearing about or, or reading about. So it's just a matter of when they find something that has their niche and does talk about it in that way, then they sort of glob onto it. But, but you know, um, even when we started our podcast and we started ours m- much after uh, you started yours, Mark, you know, that was back in 2018, I think. I remember telling people, oh, yeah, we have a podcast now. And you talk to your older generation and they'd say, oh, what? You know, they, they got videos, they get that, or photos, they get that. And you have to say, it's kind of like a radio show that you record and then you post later. And then they, they'd sort of get it. But right. like, oh, a radio show, like back in the old days. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, in some ways, though, like when you when you do break the platform down... And, and I'm sure even personally, like Mark, it sounds like, you know, you were obviously listening to podcasts and you're like, oh, man, this is like I'm I'm connected to the host. This is like amazingly uh, informative and valuable information. Um, and you look at like where like when you have time, like we're talking about, you know, being busy, you have two kids, like you have a job, you're doing so many things. And like so when do you have time to consume content or learn? It's during free time. That's not really free time. It's like you're feeling like you're driving to work or you're commuting, and it's like you have that time to yourself, which is very rare nowadays, and, you know, the ability to chat with some of the folks like you do or, or we do and take a lifetime of knowledge, a lifetime of knowledge, and condense it into an hour and get unique perspectives, um, just just the, the level of value there, I think, yeah. is like uh, it's almost uh, – Priceless, yeah. I guess. So here, here's a question for you, Mark. So you've been podcasting now for, if I did the math right, about seven years or so, seven eight years. If you did, if, yep. I guess if you started it in 2013, yeah, you're working on that seven. We obviously keep coming up with podcast topics over here, but we've only been going for now two years. Podcast topics, when you're. Uh, especially um, we have the benefit too of being optics, right? So we can talk about shooting, we can talk about hunting, we can talk about whatever. Um, how do you how do you keep talking about hunting for seven years? I, I I don't want that to sound like, oh, it's just hunting, you know, you'll Scott Parks, right? But But it's like sometimes having to have your full-time job be coming up with content that's related to one specific subject and I still hear, you know, and, and and for good reason. And I've listened to some of them as well. Everybody's tuning into the Wire to Hunt podcast when it comes out. Who's who's into hunting? So clearly, there's and, and you know, there's new stuff coming out all the time. People are learning new things. There's new people coming on. It's managing that has got to be. You ever just like wind up scratching your head, like how do how do we keep coming up with stuff to talk about? <laughs> I mean, you're you're more than three hundred episodes deep. Like, how, what what are you on right now, Mark? 359. 359. 359. And I'd say, I mean, safely assume that most of that subject matter is, I mean, it's not necessarily even hunting. It's it's, it's predominantly whitetail hunting, yes? Yeah, it's like 90% whitetail hunting. I mean, that's a lot of episodes on on whitetail bucks. But it's, a, <laughs> I, but a, I mean, yeah, maybe maybe touch on that. And I, I, you know, I guess I'd say it's, I mean, it's definitely a testament to how, Whitetail crazy folks are, including myself. Well, that and also how not necessarily simple whitetail hunting is, yes. as as some people might think it is. You know, just how could you talk for three hundred and some odd episodes about just going out and sitting in a tree and just kind of like listening to the wind blow until a deer walks by? It's like, well, there's more to it than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there there is a lot to it. Um, so, so you're right. You certainly there certainly have been times I'm like, man, how do we find a new way to do this? How do we keep it fresh? Where do we go from here? So I've certainly had various moments over the years where I've thought that, where I've been racking my head trying to figure out how do we take this into the next level? How do we, um, how do we make sure this is the best thing out there? I really want this to be the highest quality, best possible white tail deer hunting podcast it possibly can be. And, 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 and it should be the very best out there. I've, I've got, the experience, we have the connections, we have the resources. There's no reason why this shouldn't be the best thing out there. So I'm, I'm, 
I, I try to set that standard for myself and try not to get lazy with it and just do the same thing over and over. Now, inevitably, sometimes there is some of the same kind of thing, right? I mean, that is the curse of the deer hunting world that there have been 10 million articles written about the rut and 10 million articles written about food plots or whatever. So there's some things that are hit on over and over and over again. The way I try to address that is, is probably twofold. Number one, I'm always trying to find new voices, new people out there who've got a different perspective, who have a different set of experiences, who come from different places, who approach it in new ways. So try to highlight people that, that go about it in new, unique, interesting ways. Um, and then secondly, and I think maybe this is something that, um, that, at least this is something I try to hang my head on, is I try to be the very best question asker in the podcasting world, at least in this sliver of it. Um, I, I actively try to learn better ways to be an, how to be a better interviewer, how to get deeper into things, how to, how to predict the things that the listeners want to know about. So as I'm podcasting, as I'm interviewing someone, I'm constantly trying to also be the listener and think mm -hmm. through what this person maybe doesn't know all the background I know. What are the things this person is, is curious about? Or when he's hearing such and such say A, B, and C. In his head or her head, she's thinking, well, I don't understand this part, though. I try to predict those things and make sure I get the follow-ups and that I dig in deeper where I need to, that I steer the, the, the conversation in the right ways to, to make this interesting and new. Um, so that's something that, that hopefully is, is felt across the other side of the line. I hope that listeners keep tuning in because they know that even if we're still talking about deer, that there's going to be an opportunity to, to get it in the most interesting, new, unique, clear, concise way. It's going to help you out. Um, that said, I'm still brainstorming, still thinking about ways to, to pivot, do new things, change it up still. Um, all sorts of new ideas I'm thinking about in my head too for the upcoming year or so. So, so yes, there's always that risk. Um, but as you mentioned, Jimmy, white-tailed deer are fascinating. Hunting is a lot more uh, nuanced than just heading out there and sitting and listening to the leaves. If you want to get really serious about it, you can dive in 360, you know, 65 days a year and learn something new. So, mm -hmm. so that's kind of the approach we take is we dig in really deep on minutia. And for the people that are into that stuff, um, usually you can't get enough. What do you, um, what do you think now? Obviously you hunt a lot, um, and you still maintain hunting a lot, even with all these, uh, things you have going on all the time. What do you think, um, and I'll try and be a good question asker here, but what do you think is, um, in terms of the knowledge you've gained over the years, whitetail hunting, obviously you have your experience of actually going out and doing it, but then you have the really unique experience of being in person or on phone calls or, you know, virtually whatever, like we're doing here, interviewing people that are super knowledgeable. Um, and then not only that, but also getting then feedback from listeners who may have, you know, their own opinions and stuff like that. How has, um, I mean, I, I can only imagine that this process has actually influenced you as a deer hunter in so many ways. How, how do you look at yourself as the deer hunter you were before you started really diving into wired to hunt versus where you are now? And what do you think you attribute most of that to? Like the change in your growth is that? I'd say it's like the difference between... Uh go into like a YMCA eight year old pickup basketball game and then go in and watch LeBron James play for the Lakers. <laughs> That's saying I'm like LeBron James, but that kind of different as the deer hunter I was when I was 18 compared to the deer hunter I am is 32. Um, yeah. have have just had a transformational change with how I approach deer hunting, how I think about deer hunting um, and, and the success I can have. So a lot of that is attributed to, it's the two things you just said, really, right? It's one, it's a lot more time in the woods, but, but time in the woods doesn't necessarily do things for you. There's, there's this idea, maybe you guys have heard about this concept, um, the whole 10,000 hour concept. You guys heard mm -hmm. about that with this idea that you can achieve expertise in something if you have 10,000 hours of practice in. Well, yeah. that is like a really high level, um, summary of a bunch of research that was done on achieving expertise. And there's a really important qualifier in there that is usually missed when people talk about this 10,000 hour rule. There's the, the fact that it can't just be 10,000 hours of practice. It has to be 10,000 hours of, um, per, I'm, I'm going to get the word wrong. 
but essentially purposeful practice. Yeah. So doing something in an informed way for a specific reason with a specific goal in mind, not just mindlessly doing the thing, but practicing with a purpose. And I went from being out there in the woods a decent bit, kind of mindlessly trying to figure it out to now going into the woods with a very clear set of ideas of things I wanted to try and test and see, does this work? Does this not work? Um, so that is where the whole interview and all the podcasts and all the experience that I got to have learning from the best deer hunters in the world. That's how all that translated to me is I was able to take all these new ideas, take all these suggestions, take all these totally different world views when it comes to deer hunting and then mm-hmm. apply that and guinea pig it out in the, out in the wild myself. Mm-hmm. So selfishly, it's been amazing. It's helped me, you know, in just unbelievable ways. Um, there's, there's been so many different ways to skin the cat as a deer hunter. There's a lot of different ways to kill a deer. You, I mean, in all my conversations, that might be the thing that stands out the most is I've talked to, you know, everyone who you would possibly think of is, is best deer hunters in the world. And so many of them you can point to, and they take wildly different approaches to getting the job done. They, they might completely disagree with each other. If you've stuck them in the same room, um, they'll call each other idiots and there's no way you can kill a deer like that. My way is the best. <laughs> but they, they're still all doing it. They're able to get the job done. So I think I, I discovered that there are, there's no rules. There's no one set way to do it. There's certain fundamental things that you have to account for, right? You have to figure out a way to stay hidden. You have to figure out a way to avoid getting winded. You have to figure out a way to either realize, understand where the deer are and intercept them or get the deer to come to you. There's these core simple things that yes, you have to do them, but then there's 15, 20, 30 different ways you can achieve each of those specific goals. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, you know, selfishly, I've been able to just pick and prod at all of those things to understand as best as possible. And hopefully, you know, everybody listening has been able to benefit in the same way. Yeah. Well, I imagine that makes you just having that knowledge, like an incredibly versatile hunter, you know, you might look at a property or, you know, whether it's public or private and maybe with your, uh, you know, I guess your, 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 your toolbox of tactics, you might look at a spot and go, well, that's unhuntable. I can't kill a buck there because of, you know, ABC, but because you've learned X, Y, Z, you're like, oh no, I can kill a buck there. I just need to do it this way. Are, do you, do you ever find yourself like you listen you, or, or you interview somebody and you get a couple nuggets of information and almost like actively searching out a spot to test that where, where those tactics or those tips might be more effective. Like I like, I want to try hunting like this or do this thing. So I'm going to look for a property that has, or a piece of public that has maybe certain attributes. Um, especially when there's like certain regional specific type uh, ideas. So for example, a lot of guys that hunt out in the great plains are utilizing more ground hunting tactics where you're sneaking in, spotting and stalking on white tails, uh, or using decoys on the ground while moving in on white tails. Like that kind of thing sounds fascinating and is very you know, habitat type specific. So that kind of thing intrigues me. Another thing is like tracking deer down in the snow, like they do traditionally in the Northeast. Um, that's something that I'm fascinated by and I'm trying to go do that this year. What I think I end up doing more than hearing something specific, you know, that I want to go seek out an area, it it more so comes down to, as you mentioned, Mark, there's, there's all these different ideas. There's all these different tools. Now I have my toolbox that, yeah, you can go to a new place and, and you're not stumped right away, or at least you get there and you do have some avenues. And I think this leads to the third thing that's really helped me over the recent past decade or so. And that is putting myself in new situations where you're forced to do that. It's really easy to just hunt the same family farm or the same little piece of ground by your house over and over and over again. And that's just what you do. And it's fun. It's comfortable. It's just what you do. But I think it's really easy to stagnate and plateau with your growth as a deer hunter and and learning if that's all you do. So I've actively tried to hunt every year in new places, new states, new regions, new situations. And that has absolutely catapulted my um, growth and the things I've learned. Because when you stick yourself in new challenges like that, you're forced to figure out new ways of doing things. You're forced to take in all these new factors and variables and put that puzzle together again from brand new. And that, that not only is helpful 
in becoming a better deer hunter, but it's a lot of fun. Like that's really what I love about deer hunting is that new puzzle every time. And so, so I actively love going to different places and, and trying to figure it out from ground zero. Yeah, no, I totally, I agree with that a hundred percent. I mean, so much of the fun is the research, you know, figuring it out, trying new things, seeing new things, seeing new places. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think overall or as a whole, it makes you a, a better outdoorsman. It makes you a better hunter. And it also gives you things that maybe you learn something in, you know, you know, South Dakota or Montana, but you are able to apply it to maybe your home state that you do get to hunt more often. So I think that's, I mean, I think that's a really, really big thing to point out. And, and I think, a, I think a lot of, not a secret. I think that's what a lot of people enjoy is, is that process for sure. Mm. Man, I was just thinking that it's like something that, something that pops in my head on occasion when we do either podcasts about hunting or just when you talk to people about hunting is how, how interesting humans are as, as hunters compared to other animals that are predators or hunters too, you know, I mean, think about the fact that we're podcasting to talk about hunting so that other humans that are hunters can listen to it and get better at hunting via that, you know, I mean, and when you compare that to say some cat, you know, that whatever mountain lion, who knows what, it just figures it out. You know, it goes out there. You talk about purposeful, time spent out in the wilderness hunting, you know, a lot of these natural predators and whatnot, that's pretty much all they have because they can't stick on headphones and listen to Mark Kenyon tell them how to hunt a deer. But humans, we have so many resources that we can use. Somebody who, you know, is, they don't necessarily have all that time in the woods can still go in and listen and get a good head start and not feel completely lost uh, when they step out there, that's, I don't know. It's no, I d- they definitely don't have the digital assets, uh, that we do, Jim. And I, I imagine the life of a mountain lion is, is a little bit more, well, they have their innate hunting instincts, right? Which, which we have right. as well, but we don't necessarily grow up in, uh, you know, uh, uh, a tribe of hunters, if you will, or I'd say at least commonly in the U S we don't where it's, uh, part of your daily life and a little bit more, you know, sink or swim, like the life of a mountain lion. Yeah. And in some, but in some places though, I suppose I shouldn't say all humans are this way. Cause in some places humans are that way too. You know, they, just, this is they grow up doing it and that's just how they learn. They don't listen to podcasts to how to learn how to do it, but we just have so many other things going on in, in modern society. You know, it's like a million other things going on. You can't just go out and I don't know. It, I, that was a total aside, the, but the, I just, it was tripping me up because I, I started thinking about it. I was like, man, this is interesting. We're going to take this moment to philosophize about hunting and technology. What can I say? All right, Mark. So you're, from, from what I gather, a, a native Michigander, correct? And, I mean, in all your podcasting and, and your love and passion for whitetails and, and hunting some other states. And I think there's, you know, uh, other states that are probably more notable as, you know, uh, better whitetail hunting states. But it just, it does seem like you have a love for your home state. What, what is it about Michigan that, that keeps you there? I mean, is it, is it the challenge? Is it because it's home? Like, what, what keeps you in Michigan? and loving the pursuit of whitetails in that state. Yeah, so you're right. There de- definitely are other states that uh, are more heavily touted as whitetail destinations and where I probably could have a lot more su- success, quote-unquote. Um, but, yeah, Michigan's home. I do love Michigan. My family's in Michigan. We got a lot, a lot of good things going there. But from a hunting perspective, I'll, I'll say this. Um it has enough good things going for it as far as like there's plenty of deer in certain parts of the state. You certainly have an opportunity to see a mature buck on occasion. You can, if you play all your cards right and do everything the way you need to do it, work really hard, you can have an annual chance at a mature buck. It's not like going to Iowa. It's not like going to Ohio. Um, I've hunted all those other states and I can tell you it's night and day different. It's like a different world you're hunting in but it's still possible to have that kind of success if you want to. Um, At the same time, you could compare Michigan to maybe Maine 
and they would say, oh man, Michigan is another world. There's so many more nice bucks in Michigan than Maine or wherever. So everything's relative. Yeah. Um, but what I'll tell you is, is Michigan does have challenges. Probably the biggest challenge is hunting pressure. There's almost more deer hunters in Michigan than any other state. I think Pennsylvania might have a few more. Um, but just a lot, a lot of people and most of the deer hunters are all crammed into the bottom third of the state, which is where most of the farm country is. And most of the people are, most of the cities are. So you take this huge, you know, top two or three states in the country and you cram them all into a third of our state. And you get a lot of people in a small area trying to chase deer. So because of that, these deer are very well educated. Uh, because of that, there's a lot of people shooting the first buck they see. So there just aren't as many mature bucks as you might see in a state like Iowa or even Wisconsin. Um, or definitely like Western states, Kansas, Nebraska, whatever. Um, so that's the biggest thing. When I go from Michigan to Nebraska or Michigan to Iowa or Michigan to Montana, like it's, it's four or five X, the number of just potential mature targets out there. And, and for me, that's my goal is to try to kill a mature buck, which I consider like four and a half years or, or older. Mm-hmm. Um, so right. That, that leaves you with an inherent challenge in Michigan. But what I do believe, what I like, the thing that I get a kick out of, I guess, is that if you can kill a buck in Michigan, if you can become a really good hunter in Michigan, I think you can kill him anywhere or just about anywhere. Um, you can go to some of these other states and, and have it pretty well nailed down. You got to learn the new area, you got to learn the new regional specifics, but you're set with a certain skill set that is applicable anywhere. So I, I'm, I appreciate the fact that I can hone my craft in a place where it's not particularly easy to do it, but in a place where at least if you do it right, you can have opportunities still. So there's enough of a payoff every once in a while that it keeps me excited about it and enough of a challenge to constantly need to improve, constantly need to work harder, constantly study more, think through new ideas. Um, I can't get lazy. If I get lazy, I'm just not going to have any success here. So as somebody who loves to be challenged, as somebody who, who loves to push for that next thing, uh, Michigan naturally does that pretty well for me. And uh, on occasion, I get really frustrated and I can hate my state for that. But uh, most of the time, I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I mean you can. You, you, apparently, you're a good question asker and a good question answerer because you actually pre-answered my follow-up question to that. Was like, do you think that makes you a better hunter when you go to some of these other places? And I think, yeah, n- no question, right? Um, yeah. It's kind of like, yeah, if you can kill uh, or be a successful deer hunter or kill a mature buck here, man, you can you can do it anywhere. And and uh, I mean, adversity and tough conditions definitely make you better at, you know, really anything. Right. So that's, uh, that's super cool. I want to, um, your book, I I definitely want to talk about your book, Mm -hmm. that wild country. Uh, I'm not, I actually have it right here. I'm not, if anybody's watching, they can see it right now. So I'm not all the way through it, but really, really enjoying it. And I mean, obviously I've, I've read some of your writing over the years, but I think this is kind of, I guess the, the first, like, long form that I've read and, and really like, I was like, Mark, you're, you're an excellent writer. You're an excellent, I guess, verbal communicator, but, um, the writing in here is, is fantastic. And I'm not, I'm not just saying that because you're sitting in front of, like, I was, I'm very like legitimately impressed with it. So nice work on that. Um, thank you. Question one about the book. What, what inspired you to take that on? I guess it starts about, oh, I don't know, 12 years ago, 12, 13 years ago when I headed out West for the first time as an adult. Um, actually, on my way to start full-time at Google, my girlfriend and I at the time decided to road trip across the country from Michigan to California and spend three weeks camping and backpacking and exploring three national parks in between there. So we went to Rocky Mountain National Park, Yellowstone, and Grand Teton National Park. And just had like a mind blowing experience. Um, I'd always been in the outdoors and all those things. Like I've told you, I've been hunting since I was a kid. Our vacations are always hiking, camping, that kind of thing. But it always been usually pretty regional with a few exceptions. But seeing the big, vast, mountainous public land expanses of the Rocky Mountain interior, I just, I don't know, I got a dagger through the heart and I, I fell in love with it. And ever since that first trip, We've returned every year uh, for increasingly longer, longer periods of time. 
Uh, eventually, we, we started renting a house for a couple months a year, living out here in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem area. Then we bought an old camper and renovated it and started living out there doing things. Um, and so just spent more and more and more time on public land, living on public land, spending big chunks of our year appreciating it. And as that's all happening, I also am becoming increasingly aware of threats to these places. Um, as you guys are aware, back like 2014, 15, 16, there started to get a lot of uh, noise around this idea of a land transfer movement that was picking up. People saying, hey, we shouldn't have all these public lands. You need to sell them to people that want to buy them or transfer them to the states and let the states do what they want with them. And so I started learning all about that. And I started getting worried, like, wow, this this huge part of my life is is in real serious danger. So as all that's going on, I'm also realizing that I don't understand a lot of the context around it. I don't understand how we got to this point. I don't understand why these things are controversial or why certain industries want to do this or why certain people want to do that. And I'm thinking to myself, I work in this world. Like I work in the hunting and outdoor industry. And if I don't know these things, there's got to be a whole lot more people all over the country that are in the same boat and probably know a lot less. And if all these people don't know about what's going on, they don't understand the history or the context or the current events, how are we ever going to be able to protect these places and keep these places around for us to hunt and fish and camp and bird watch and whatever? Um, and that all led me to believe I had to do something. There had to be something I could do to try to make a positive difference to help this thing I love so much. And I saw this big knowledge gap and I thought, well, hey, if I need to learn about this stuff. Maybe I can bring everybody along for that learning process, kind of just like I do with the podcast, right? I want to learn these things. I want to share what I learned with everybody in the podcast. I thought I could do that same thing with the history of our public lands and an examination of what's happening right now. And the book seemed the way to do that because I'm a bookworm. I absolutely love to read. I love to write. Um, I'm, I'm like, other than the outdoors, it's reading that I'm obsessed with. And I'd always had the dream of writing a book. And so I'm constantly also trying to, as we talked about with the podcast, trying to figure out what's next, how to take this to the next level. Well, the same thing with, with my career and with my projects in general. A book was one of those things that I had set for myself at some point. I, I wanted to do it as a dream. And as all these other factors I just described came together, it, it just got to a point where I realized, okay, I, I need to write a book. There's a need here with this issue. I have a personal fascination with it. Um, this is the thing. And so I started working on it back in, it was 2015 or 16, I think, when I started early on. And, uh, you know, it was years and years worth of work and a whole bunch of stuff that led to it finally coming out uh, in 2019. That's awesome. That's super cool. Yeah, I mean, and definitely, I mean, it sounds like just uh, similarities with, you know, the Wired to Hunt platform and and this book, you know, I think, from the outside in, you go, oh, boom, Mark wrote a book, you know, and it's like, whoa, no, that's five years of yeah. in the making. So that's, that's amazing. What do you, um, what do you think? Like, uh, I don't want to say that you're like the only person who's sort of done something like this because I see sort of, uh, maybe a growing trend of people who, uh, are like this, but obviously you're big time Midwestern, um, whitetail hunter. And then you also have this just grand appreciation for the West, um, Rocky Mountain area, all that stuff, right? And so often we talk about, I mean, I know when we deal with product so often and a lot of our product can get tailored to one or the other. Somebody may want something that's specific to one side or the other and you have this Midwestern slash Eastern hunter that hunts whitetail in dense forests or, you know, they're not ever shooting very far or seeing very giant expanses. And then you have this Western hunter and... They're very, uh, they're very different. And, and now I see more people who cross over, essentially, we'll, we'll call it cross over the Mississippi, even though obviously it's, that's not exactly the definite line. But, uh, but for so long, and I still see some um, stigmas out there where, you know, the, the real hardcore Western guys are, yeah, yeah, Midwest, you know, stuff, that whitetail stuff, not that interesting. Or, you know, the whitetail guys... They get really into whitetail hunting and, you know, oh, yeah, that, I mean, it's cool what those guys do over in the West, but, you know, it's whatever. It doesn't affect me that much. Um, you know, what What are your thoughts around um, people being so uh, sort of 
glued in terms of focus to only one half or one side of things or, or keeping themselves in a bit of a bubble or siloed off from the rest of the country or realistically speaking, you know, there's a lot of stuff around the world too, but we'll just talk about the country. Um, and just not really knowing what's going on or caring what's going on elsewhere. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts around that? Yeah. I mean, I would say I understand in a lot of cases we have our limitations with time or resources or whatever, where the local stuff is what you have to do. I get that. Mm -hmm. But if I would just say for somebody who does have the ability to get out of that local sphere, get out of that comfort zone, I can't recommend it enough. Either way, going from the West to the East or the East to the West, I think just totally different experiences, different worlds, different animals, different, different challenges. Um, and, and so often that is what, you know, that's the fun is, is this new experience, at least for me, maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but it's, it's, it's figuring out these new things, seeing these new landscapes, experiencing these different cultures. Um, and we have that all within America. It's, it's a crazy, amazing thing. We have that. And, um, I think it's a, it's a shame to not take advantage of that if you can. Mm -hmm. Um, I would secondly say, especially when it comes to people who don't necessarily live in the West or wherever these big expanses of public lands are, it is sometimes easy, especially in the past. I think as a community, we've done a better job the last five years or so of starting to look at the bigger picture. But, you know, we, even if you live in New York or Georgia, you own that land in Montana or Alaska or California or Arizona. That's yours. That's ours. Uh, we are as cliche as it's become now we are public land owners and that's a pretty damn cool thing. And so, um, I would encourage you to first and foremost, if you can go see these places, take advantage of that, you know, use your rights as a, you know, as, as somebody who lives here to go enjoy these places. It's, it's free and open to you in most cases, and you can have some unbelievable experiences. I think once you do that, once you've seen these places and experienced them to some degree, then it's a lot easier for me to ask you to pay attention to them and stick up for them. Um, I think once you have even just one experience, it's, it's hard not to want to become an advocate of some kind when you realize what that, you know, that evening watching the sunset over the Grand Canyon, the sky painted pink, blue, and purple. You see that once, how can you not want to make sure that your kids get to see that or your grandkids? Uh, one night spent on a mountain in Montana where the elk are screaming across the other side of the valley and your hairs are rising up on the back of your neck and you lay in bed at night and you're trying to sleep and you can't sleep because the elk keep bugling. That's the kind of thing that sticks with you. And um, you can't help but want to fight for that in the future. There's so many examples like that. And so um, I would tell you, enjoy the diverse range of opportunities we have. It's not it's not out of reach. If you can afford a, a tank or two of gas and take a drive, you can usually do these things very much on the cheap. Um, for years and years, I just head out here and sleep in the back of my truck, sleep in a tent, cheap Walmart tent. You don't need fancy equipment. Of course, having good equipment's great. It's nice. You want to have it if you can, but don't let that keep you from going and seeing these places mm -hmm. and um, exploring them. And you don't even need to go out for a hunt your first year, even just getting out there and walking around and camping and just seeing what this place is all about to prepare yourself for the next time. Even that's something worth doing. Um, so at a high level, I would just encourage people to, to go enjoy what we have. There, there's a lot there to be, to be enjoyed. Mm, definitely can't say that any better at all, Mark. And I think you nailed, nailed that on the head. And I guess the only, the only thing I would caution a person with uh, is if they haven't done something like that and they go take a trip and step outside of maybe their comfort zone or what they're used to and they see one of these uh, new wild places, um, it will not be the last time they do it. It will be, like you said, becomes an annual thing and maybe even a more of an annual thing during your annual thing and then you're just going to be mm -hmm. doing it as much as you can. It is super addictive. Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's kind of neat when you have people that are, let's say, you know, you're going from, you know, whether it's West to East or East to West, but you take time to figure out what it's like for fellow hunters and outdoorsmen and women, you know, in their place. Um, because, because when you, when you really think about what's happening there, I mean, 
So-and-so might be a hunter in Wisconsin, big time. They enjoy going outside. They enjoy hunting whitetail from a tree stand. And you may have someone who is a big-time hunter in Arizona, and it's vastly different. Mountainous, desert, you know, um, we've been there. It's extremely <laughs> rough uh, walking around. Lots of cactus. Everything wants to poke you. Um, different quarry that you're going after in different ways. But at the same time, those two different people doing very different things, they're still... Hunters and, you know, outdoorsmen and women in the United States. And to your point, Mark, like you were saying, the public land that one of them hunts on in Arizona and the public land that one of them hunts on in Wisconsin, they both own that. And, um, you know, and they both in, in large ways support one another by being in the lifestyle and the sport that they're in. Um, and I know we've said it, I, I feel like I've gone on this tangent before, but when, uh, Midwestern hunter goes and they, they buy equipment, you know, for their hunt or for shooting or whatever, you know, there's, there's obviously Pittman Robertson that goes into the conservation stuff, but then you have just the fact that you're supporting businesses in the industry that then can create products that support both people and their different adventures and their different applications. Um, and, uh, and yeah, you can't, you can't look at yourself totally in a silo, um, cause if, if any, uh, big thing that's very valuable to, to hunters or shooters or, uh, anglers or outdoors and people, um, goes away at any point in time, it's not, it's not going to not affect everybody else somewhere, you know, or elsewhere in the country. Well, yeah. And I think anytime you can, you know, we've touched on this even in this podcast, but any, anytime you can div- diversify your experiences, I mean, the result is going to be growth, you know, and I think that's with hunting and and a lot of things and you're just going to be, you know, have uh, different interesting perspectives. You know, I mean, I know one example is from a hunting perspective, you know, I'd never hunted Wisconsin before. Right. And, and, uh, my first hunt here was actually a rifle hunt. And like I said, I grew up hunting blacktails where you might, you might, at least where we hunted hear a shot in a day. And I think my first time hunting Wisconsin, I probably heard, 200 shots that, <laughs> that morning. And yeah, then, and then that I, sounds about right. I also thought I was in some sort of gar hole because I hadn't seen, I didn't see a single deer until 10 a.m. I was like, what the, I mean, it was literally every couple seconds, but we li- we do, we are super fortunate. We, have an, we live in a phenomenal deer state with a lot of deer and somehow at the end of that nine day season, there's still a lot of deer left. Um, yes. So but anyway, but that was like, that was cool. Like now th- after that experience, like if I talk to somebody from Wisconsin, like I have that perspective of their deer hunt challenges they face, you know, and, and just, you know, can visualize, you know, and communicate with them and and learn Mm -hmm. from what they have going on. So, um, yeah, we should get stoked if there's, you know, whenever somebody starts hunting in some place that's even completely different from where we're from, you know, anytime you Mm -hmm. hear about more people getting into the sport or understanding what's going on or valuing what, you know, we value as well is, is Mm -hmm. pretty cool no matter where they are, you know? And there's constants too, like Mark, you're talking about like there's certain fundamentals, like, you know, as far as from a tactic standpoint, like the wind or this and things you want to account for and be yeah. mindful of. But, and and then Jim, you brought up the Arizona hunt where we're hunting coos deer, essentially miniature whitetails. You know, you're taking a, a Wisconsin deer that could be 300 pounds, you know, or, you know, two something, whatever. And uh, then a coos deer, which could be 70 pounds, but in a, in, in a, vastly different environment but you're still watching them act like deer yeah 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 that is so there's 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 definitely there's definitely constants i guess is the what i was trying to right uh articulate there but uh um no that that's super cool that's super cool what um you got anything exciting on the docket this year mark anything anything coming up that you can share with us that that you're pumped about you know, the biggest thing is probably, you know, what we're doing over on the back 40, which is our small property that we picked up in Michigan that we're trying to document our, our efforts to transform this little place into a wildlife paradise and a hunting paradise. So we, we did, we bought this place last year, documented it in season one of the back 40 and season two is now in the works this year. Um, and I think what I'm most excited there is, is year one was all about kind of learning the place. This is what we would like to do. This is what we need to do. Now in year two, we've actually been able to do some of that stuff. Um, 
So I'm really excited to, to see hopefully the fruits of our labor uh, because last year was very raw. It was, it was pretty tough hunting. And this year, I think it should be much improved both for us as hunters and for, you know, every critter out there. So, so I'm really excited about that. We've got some cool stuff in the works there. Our plans for, um, you know, giving the place away, all of that's going to be announced this year. Yeah. And we're excited to put that there. Um, so that, that's a big one. And, uh, if anyone wants to see what that's all about, it's over on the meat eater YouTube channel. And I, otherwise I've got some public land hunts myself coming up in Idaho, Nebraska, and New York or Maine, which will be fun doing some of those things we described earlier, like uh, tracking deer down in the snow. I'm pumped on that. Uh, and then the last thing I guess is I also am a, a big sucker for targeting a single specific buck for years on end. That's become something I've just become fascinated by hunting little properties and learning this one deer. And, uh, I've got one of those bucks that this will be a year three chasing this guy and, uh, very, very excited to, uh, hopefully figure, figure him out this year and wrap up that story. So, so I'm very excited for that. Oh my gosh. How, uh, year how, three, how old do you think that deer is now then? Uh, I would say he's five and a half this year. I would start first noticed him at three and a half. Okay. Wow. Ancient in deer years. <laughs> For Michigan. Yeah. You don't get, you very rarely get bucks to five and a half where I live. So, uh, yeah, he, he'll definitely be a absolute top tier buck in the area. And, uh, one I've seen a ton and passed on one year and could have taken a crack at him last year, but just wasn't comfortable with the shot. Uh, found his set of sheds with my pregnant wife and my two year old son walking around and, and we saw the antlers right in front of us. So like, oh, that'd be a cool little moment to, uh, just a great, uh, a great saga, I guess. It'd be nice to tie a bow on it. Nice. I think we got a little bit of a delay you there. So, yep. We got a little bit of a delay there. We might've been, uh, sitting there, um, staring while we were trying to listen <laughs> to the last of that. Sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you found, you said you found the match set with your, uh, wife and the two year old out there. It was super, super cool. It was a, we were just going for a walk. My, my wife was pregnant still at the time and, and do any day. It was one of those things where we just want to get it done and over with. So she's like, let's go for a walk. And, uh, maybe that'll help push this thing into action. <laughs> and, uh, so I recommended, I recommended we go out to this place I hunt. And I was like, oh, let's just go walk the cornfield by the road. It's, we can walk around and look at deer tracks and that'll be fun. So we went there and within less than, a, I don't know, two, three, four, five minutes, maybe just walking off the road. Um, there's these two antlers sitting right there and they're the number one antler that I could have possibly dreamed of finding there they were. So that was, that was really cool. Nice. Super nice. cool story. Super cool story. And what an awesome experience for the, for the whole family to be a part of that. Uh, definitely excited to hear how that story evolves. Um, and as well as the back 40 project and how that property develops and evolves really cool story there jim do you got anything else well i was just curious did the excitement of finding the uh match set cause the the baby to start oh. like did, did that process get going <laughs> after the adrenaline rush of i'm sure finding those not quite as quickly as my <laughs> wife wanted but uh within like the next five days it happened all right all right it probably had an influence of some sort it, it definitely had to have you know, caused some level of excitement. Yeah. I, I could really see doctors start using that technique to induce the, yeah, an, just, the antler technique. Maybe the doctors will start planting, <laughs> planting sheds just along your typical daily route. If it was, if it was us that deliver the baby and like I found the shed, then yeah, I'd be popping that baby out right now. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> it might need to be something different for a while. <laughs> yeah. It, they, they'd be like, we need to get you to the hospital. And you'd be like, I got to find the match. Right. <laughs> it can wait. All right, in am in amongst a few uh, technical difficulties here, I guess another another cliffhanger. But Mark, um, just gonna wrap this. Thank you. Uh, thanks for taking the time to chat with us. It was just a super insightful conversation. Really cool uh, hearing just just your story and how you know the wired to hunt story as a whole. If anybody out there is interested in whitetail deer, whitetail deer behavior, whitetail hunting, check out the Wired to Hunt platform, the Wired to Hunt podcast. Your library is probably unmatched on that subject. 
Uh, you're an expert question asker. Uh, I know when I personally listen to the podcast, I'm like, you listen to the guest and I'm like, oh my gosh, well, what about this? And I'm like, oh, thank goodness he asked the question. So um, that, I know that happens to me a lot of time. Um, check out Mark's book, That Wild Country. Uh, excellent read. Again, I'm chomping at the bit to get all the way through this thing, but man, it's just a really, really um, cool window into our public lands, as Mark said, and just kind of the story behind them. Um, and, and really great information. It, you don't have to be a hunter. You don't have to be an angler to enjoy uh, the stories in here, the accounts and the information and the story about these places that um, we as, uh, as Americans are, are fortunate enough to uh, have access to and, and be uh, collective owners of. So check that out. Uh, super cool book. Uh, I think that's all I got. Yeah. Any final thoughts? Oh, it was great. It was great talking with you, Mark. Thank you. Hey, thank you, guys. I really appreciate the opportunity and I'm happy to come back anytime. I promise I will be somewhere with a better LTE signal. Oh, there we go. That last part came in loud and clear. We got somewhere we- with a better LTE signal. <laughs> That's all right. You're in your mobile office. <laughs> You're in your mobile office. You're uh, you're somewhere in in you know the middle of who knows where that wild country. I'm sure. And uh, but yeah, we uh, we appreciate you joining us. If you want to get away from technology, step into that wild country. Exactly. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. All right. That'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks everybody for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation Podcast. Again, everybody, thanks and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.